Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about military transports, one of the least glamorous aspects of war, if war can even be considered glamorous. While most of the attention goes to your fighter planes and tanks and guns and artillery, all of those things rely on transport vehicles in one way or another. Those vehicles, big and small, from massive cargo planes to your simple horse and cart, are moving troops, ammunition, fuel, tanks, artillery pieces, food, clothing. All manner of transportation vehicles play a vital role in any country fighting a war. As should be rather apparent, Germany was no exception, and in 1940, they found their transport aircraft rather lacking. While a great deal of equipment and materiel would be delivered by truck or rail or small aircraft, they had a pressing issue, and that issue was Britain. While the German army was having incredible success at defeating the French and pushing the British to Dunkirk and back to Britain proper, there was still the plan to invade Britain that they had to worry about. The problem now was that Germany was severely lacking in transport vehicles of any kind that could bring heavy equipment like tanks and artillery across the English Channel. Sure, their smaller vehicles could bring those things along piecemeal, but for a full-scale invasion, that simply wasn't going to work. They needed something bigger. Much, much bigger. So, on October 18, 1940, even while the Battle of Britain was winding down and it was becoming increasingly apparent that Germany would not be invading Britain anytime soon, as a few days prior, the planned invasion of Britain was delayed, a directive was nonetheless sent out to Junkers and Messerschmitt, a design proposal for a large transport glider. Large enough to move something like an 88 or a Panzer IV was to be presented in just 14 days' time. From this directive, three total designs would be born, two directly from it and one as a derivative. These would be the ME-321, the ME-323, and our subject for today, the Junkers JU-322 Mammoth. Before we get into the JU-322 proper, I think there's a few questions. Why did they request gliders and not powered aircraft? With these gliders needing to be large enough to transport tanks and artillery, wouldn't it have made more sense for them to be powered on their own? We'll get to that second question a little later, but for the first, they were requested as gliders because as Germany was currently fighting Britain and had plans to fight the Soviet Union at a later date, more important materials and equipment like engines and aircraft-grade metal were to be used on fighters and bombers and the like. Junkers and Messerschmitt basically had to make their transport vehicles without engines, and with as little vital resources as possible. So, this led to Junkers making the JU-322 almost entirely out of wood, and to Messerschmitt making the ME-321 of mixed construction, part wood and part metal. And while the ME-321 looked mostly like a normal plane, the JU-322 did not. Measuring in at 30 and a quarter meters long and a colossal 62 meters or over 200 feet wide, the JU-322 kind of looks like a manta ray to me. Manta rays are like the airplanes of the sea after all, even though nobody calls them that, so I think this connection makes perfect sense. In the front, between the two little nubs you see, was the cargo bay. The front door would open upwards and a ramp would be extended down to the ground, allowing the crew to load or offload whatever armor or equipment they were moving. The cockpit would be offset to the left, presumably so that the cockpit was not in the way of the doors when they opened upwards. Its wing design would look akin to a tailless flying wing, but a relatively standard-looking tail with vertical and horizontal stabilizers would protrude from the rear. The glider would also be relatively lightly armed with just three 7.92mm MG-15 machine guns in three separate turrets. Two of them on those front nubs and one of them pointing towards the rear at the base of the tail. 
I should also mention that those two front nubs may not have, at least initially, been intended as turret sections, but rather as counterbalancing weights. As for the most important aspect of the 322, it was initially projected to be able to carry upwards of 20,000 kilos of cargo. Oddly enough, while the 322 and 321 were both made to carry tanks like the Panzer IV, its upward limit of 20,000 kilos was actually less than the weight of a Panzer IV or even a Panzer III. It would be able to carry a few Panzer IIs, though, and also a few 88s. To put its maximum carry weight into a different, more relatable perspective, the 20,000 kilo limit would mean that it could carry roughly over 7,000 gallons of fuel, equivalent to your average fuel tanker truck. While certainly not as much as your standard cargo train, being able to move that much to places without rail lines would certainly be enticing. And while it was enticing, as Junkers would discover, it also may not have been feasible. At the very least, not feasible with their design. While Junkers was first building the 322, which was its own problem in of itself because Junkers hadn't built all wood aircraft in decades, they had to test how well the cargo bay could hold something heavy, like, say, a tank, possibly something like the Panzer IV or Panzer III. When they moved the tank into the cargo bay, the sheer weight of the tank compacted the floor, basically going through the floor without actually going through it. This obviously meant that the glider, as it was designed, would not be able to carry what it was intended to carry. Instead of altering the design in a way to reach the intended carry weight, it was instead altered to carry much less than originally intended. The maximum load weight was reduced down to 16,000 kilos, and later it would be further reduced down to 11,000. Still, despite this severe reduction in weight, the now 11,000 kilo maximum load was still quite a lot more than Germany's primary cargo plane, the Ju-52, and its roughly 3,000 kilo maximum load. If the 322 flew well and was, in general, feasible and easy to make, then it would still be quite useful, still being able to carry light armored vehicles and ammo and whatnot. The real test now would be a flight test, and in April 1941, the 322 would take to the air. As it was a glider, the 322 didn't have a way to get into the air under its own power, so it would have to be towed. This is where we get back to that second question I mentioned earlier. To tow such a large, heavy glider required a large, multi-engine aircraft. For this, the Junkers Ju-90 would be used, a four-engine airliner made before the war. Now, if towing the 322, and the ME-321 for that matter, meant that these other massive multi-engine aircraft had to be used, then really, why not just make the 322 and 321 powered and save yourself the headache? Instead of having to coordinate the towing of a 200-foot-wide behemoth into the air, just put some engines on it. Regardless of my opinion, though, the 322 was made as it was, and the test flight was here. To ensure that they had enough room for both the Ju-90 and the 322 to take off, a 5-kilometer stretch of forest was leveled in front of an already built airfield. The Ju-90 needed all of that extra space and just managed to take off successfully, bringing both it and the 322 into the air. Once they were in the air, though, there were still problems. While the 322 was indeed flying, at least successful in that key aspect, it was also found that it was highly unstable when it was being towed. While under tow, it was found it had severe spiral instability, basically meaning that it kept wanting to veer off to the left or right into a downward spiral. Additionally, while not trying to spiral itself, the 322 climbed much more rapidly than the Ju-90, going so far above the Ju-90 that it pulled on the tow line and brought the tail of the Ju-90 up with it, making it incredibly difficult for the Ju-90 to continue gaining altitude. 
Despite these issues, they would manage to release the 322 safely and have it glide by itself, where it performed much better. The stability issues went away, and for all intents and purposes, it was a solidly functioning glider. Unfortunately, the glider did not make it back to the airfield, and instead landed off in a field somewhere. Because it was so large, it had to very slowly and carefully be towed back by two tanks. From the time it landed off in that field to when it was back at the airfield, two full weeks had passed. After this, Junkers planned on upgrading and altering the 322, having learned from this flight test. However, the German government had other plans. The next month, in May 1941, Junkers was ordered to cancel the 322 project outright, with the government believing that its manta ray-looking design was inherently a poor one and was not worth pursuing in any way. Junkers, in addition to their first prototype, had completed a second prototype and had already begun work on another 98 models. All of them were destroyed and were used either for other projects or just as firewood. As for the ME321, its sister project, while at the very least its design was more normal looking, it too was plagued with similar issues. The JU90 was also used initially as the towing vehicle, and it struggled severely to get the 321 off the ground. Different aircraft in different configurations were tried, from three BF-110 heavy fighters to the very bizarre-looking Heinkel HE-111Z, getting gliders like the 321 and 322 off the ground was a major chore. Additionally, once it landed, moving the 321 was similarly difficult, just as it had been for the 322. Despite these issues, the 321 had a much longer career than the 322 did, with around 200 of them being produced. By 1943, though, the German government decided to cancel the 321, and instead some of the remaining 321 frames were converted into six-engine ME-323s. At this point, it seems like the German government finally gave up on their heavy cargo glider idea due to the inherent limitations brought about by the sheer size and lack of propulsion of said designs. In the end, these heavy cargo gliders were kind of ridiculous. Germany lacked the aircraft that could efficiently and effectively tow them into the air. It certainly would have made much more sense, in hindsight, to just bite the bullet and make powered multi-engine aircraft that could fly on their own. At the very least, with the ME-321's more conventional design, it could be converted into a powered aircraft. With the JU-322, on the other hand, its very unconventional design earned it no favors with the German government, and they ended up cutting the project altogether, not even attempting to make a powered version. Still though, even though the 322 failed, it still lives on in our hearts as that big manta ray in the sky. Alright, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So, while I was writing this video, my channel somehow hit 10,000 subscribers, so that's pretty neat. I certainly didn't expect that I would reach that many subs in under a year, and it's actually kind of amazing to me that it's happened. So, thank you to everyone that has subscribed, and at least thank you to all the people who haven't but still watch my content. Your viewership and support is greatly appreciated. So anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!